Next, we hear about co-production. The next session title is Circum Content Exchange. Please welcome to the stage Alexander Pletzer from RTBF Belgium and Circum Regional Co-Production Coordinator. Thank you. And stage is yours. <laughs> Microphone. Should see how, how it works. So I will uh, ask to uh, Martina to join us and uh, Piotr. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Is Victor? Is he? Oh, Leonor, you are there. Please uh, join join the, the stage because uh, we will have uh, panel. Please, Martina, come. And Thomas, uh, I will introduce the panel one by one uh, when we will have a dialogue. Uh, so we, are, we will talk here uh, about exchange uh, of content uh, and uh, it's somehow showcase time. Uh, uh, you will have a lot of videos and on the, of dialogue. Um, but talking about showcase, the best showcase we have here in Circom for the content exchange is uh, of course the Magnificent Gala evening yesterday. Uh, you may know that all what you saw yesterday, it's available for all the SICOM members. So that was the best showcase we have. Uh, you just have to look at the um, jury report you receive in your goodie bag in the first day and ask to the secretary what is available or to, to to get it and to, uh, and you can broadcast it on your channel. Here we will have a showcase of the co-production that we are um, uh, running now till four years. It's the citizenship project, which is on screen. Uh, and they will gather 13 members of CIRCOM who produce uh, stories on the agreed uh, topics. We uh, gather editorial committee, we decide of the topics we will uh, deal with, and each member produce stories, which is which are available for all the, the members participating to the co-production, and also to all the members of Circum. So everything you will see now is available for you. So first, I will show you the winning entry. Uh, because we also organize a special category in the pre -SICOM, and um, you will have the occasion now to see the winning uh, story, and you will also have a quick overview about our common, um, how can I say, layout and credits and CGI that are um, used by several members. I will come, in, come back to this. So I think, sorry? Oops, thank you. This one, okay. Normally, something. Ah. Please. From Azores to Poland, from France to Romania, the Circum Citizenship Project has again this year produced and shared many quality reports all around Europe. Let's highlight a few. We'll head to Slovakia to meet the inventors of a wooden computer, to Spain to talk with minor transsexuals about what they live every day, and to Azores, where some workers were depending on the American presence. But first, let's go to Slovakia with the report Wooden Computer from RTVS. It's the year award winner for the citizenship category. An original topic, the point of view of citizens, a beautiful cinematography and an excellent narrative construction convinced the judges to encourage this approach. Tento nádherný strom rastie v nízkych Tatrách, v regióne v strede Slovenska a v strede Európy. A práve na tomto mieste dvaja mladí muži vymysleli, že vyrobia počítač z dreva. Môže to znieť zvláštne alebo dokonca nemožne, ale toto je nový a veľmi úspešný startup zo Slovenska, drevený počítač. Preto, lebo nás nebavili staré plechové veľké počítače. 
preto drevený. Niečo, čo je aj ekologické. Dnešná doba je doba, kedy v domácnostiach máme viacej počítačov ako kedysi. Bude to klasický počítač notebook a všetky sú robené z kovu alebo plastu. Tam vlastne vzniká neskutočne veľký odpad, čo sa týka plastov. To drevo je materiál, ktorý vieme potom ďalej využiť, ktorý nerobí taký odpad, ktorý sa dá zrecyklovať. Nie len na to, aby sme to dali niekde do skladky. Ja v podstate som z bansko kraja, narodil som sa tu a, a pre mňa je veľmi zaujímavé venovať sa produktom a projektom, ako je práve tento. Aj z toho hľadiska, že uh, vieme uh, poskytnúť uh, niečo nové z tohto kraja, dať, dať prácu ľuďom, a respektíve nielen prácu, ale, ale aj takéto naplnenie svojho života. Takto sa celý príbeh výroby drevených počítačov začal. Drevené boxy na počítač sa vyrábajú z orechového, dubového alebo bukového dreva. Drevo sa musí sušiť prirodzene, čo bežne trvá aj pol roka. Až vtedy je pripravené na opracovanie špeciálnymi lejzrami a CNC strojom. Drevo musí byť pripravené na vysoké teploty, ktoré vzniknú vo vnútri, tedy keď bude počítač fungovať. Teplotné kritériá... Samozrejme je to tu extrémne, lebo vo vnútri spôsobia teploty okolo 50-60 stupňov. No ako vyrobiť funkčný počítač vo vnútri malej drevenej škatulky? Na to prišiel tento mladý muž zo stredného Slovenska. V tejto malej pracovni vo svojom rodinnom dome. Okrem toho vyrobil dotykové tlačidlo a ventilátor pre drevený počítač. Typy sám takéto, to sú iba jednostranné. Keď potrebujem fakt, že niečo rýchlo a lacno, tak si to vyskúšam na takéto doske. A potom to už ide do profi firmy, kde sa vyrúb... Takže... Kaskažova. So welcome Martina uh, Kaskažova, our winner. Please, you can applaud us. So Martina, you are a journalist in RTBF, uh, TVS, difficult, uh, um, in Banska Bystrica, that's it, yeah? uh, 10 years. And uh, you also benefit of uh, second training, uh, the Mojo and, uh, and two, twice, I think, or more. Is it helping you in your uh, daily work and to realize this uh, uh, story? Um, Mike. Mike. Don't have. Thank you. Okay. You have now. So uh, I started to think uh, more in pictures, not uh, so much in the world, but in pictures. So that uh, helped me to improve my work, I think. And uh, this report. Uh, Uh, you see the first picture was that tree, so uh, I think about, uh, I will make a report about that startup wooden uh, computer. So I will tell to myself, uh, it is a place near my house. Uh, I like it very much because I'm going running uh, every day and uh, this is point where I uh, like to see it, uh, look at the mountains and that, that was um, Uh, that point that I was thinking about, um, it's very nice view, it's mountains, it's nature, it's uh, an environment, uh, environmental topic, so I will start with this picture on that uh, tree, because it's about wooden computer. Excellent, and uh, if I understand well, Banska, Banska Bistica is a city uh, in the mountains, uh, in the middle of the nature, so that's why you had this ID, an original ID, and the, the guys who made the, the computer is this original ID to develop this, uh, this uh, compu wooden <laughs> computer, which is very special. Uh, yes, uh, the wooden computer is a product of uh, two young men from middle Slovakia, Uh, they are very clever. Uh, this is uh, their startup, which is uh, in these days very popular and successful uh, because they have uh, they will product uh, this uh, uh, wooden computer to many countries, uh, U.S., uh, all Europe countries. So now maybe they will be millionaire. <laughs> and um, these boys uh, think in uh, environmental topic. They think about networking, uh, clever people in my region. And uh, they have a very good idea. 
Yeah. And uh, as we are uh, supported by the European Parliament, I will coming back on this question. Uh, when the, uh, in all our region, when such uh, original activities, uh, PME, uh, PME, I think, uh, SME uh, uh, develop, uh, uh, the European Fund are never too far. Uh, did they, uh, do, did they bene benefit of European uh, Fund or uh, uh, something like that? Yes, uh, it's about uh, the part of this project is from European Fund. Uh, these two men uh, who create this uh, wooden computer will um, start uh, some another project. They will uh, build a, a big startup center in the Banska Bystrica city when they will learn uh, new startupers uh, how to improve uh, their plans and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, that's absolutely not the reason that, uh, why you choose the, the topic, because we have a uh, total indep editorial independence, but we always can find a link to, to European, and that's the, that's the, the, the topic of the, of the co-production, is to offer a cross-view about uh, citizen initiatives, citizen uh, that uh, made stuff, and, and, and uh, uh, have to deal with uh, with uh, European law and European uh, uh, inter intervention, and uh, so you choose it only because the idea was original and the citizen point of view. That was stressed by the jury in the in the in the extract that you that we we broadcast. So thank you, Martina, for the, this first intervention. Uh, traditionally, the mid the winner. Uh, um, session uh, implies some question and answer from the, the floor. So if you have questions for, the, for Martina on the, the story, it's now. Yeah. Hi there, I'm uh, Hans. I'm a member of the Mojo course from this year. So I uh, am very interested in uh, what's coming next. Uh, is this report a result of your course and did you do the, your, your work uh, as a mojo um, afterwards, only as a mojo? Or how did you use the mobile phone? Uh, this is not made by, by mojo, it's made by normal camera, this report. Okay, another question? No, so we will go further. Uh, as you may notice, I have a <laughs> big panel of uh, journalists. What is, it is interesting is that uh, Piotr and me are the, from the first generation of citizenship project that was uh, born in 2013. And it is interesting to notice that all the other people are from the new generation, the three new members of uh, the, the co-production since now 2016, Slovakia, Spain, and uh, RTPA Azor are here. That's uh, by chance, let's say. And uh, you will see that by chance, again, uh, the jury uh, has uh, um, uh, noticed some other stories that could have been some kind of comment that, that could and uh, had been uh, winners also, if. Let's have a um, quick look at the uh, best of, of the stories of this session. Régen ez természetesen volt, a 67-es kor optimizmusa kitermelt egy olyan értelmiségi réteget, akik tartották a maguk magyar tudatát, tehát ide tartozónak érezték magukat, akkor is, hogyha nem volt magyar anyanyelv. Adam Bała wie, że mógłby zarabiać na chlebie. Piec szybko, dużo i tanio. Wysypywać z worka mieszankę, mieszać z wodą i liczyć pieniądze. Ale woli piec chleb, jaki sam lubi jeść. Dzisiaj już można powiedzieć, że je się chleby chlebopodobne. Miedzibory, une petite ville à une heure de route de Varsovie. C'est là que se retrouvent chaque week-end 
les membres de l'une des plus anciennes milices du pays. Le tireur. Beaucoup de jeunes viennent s'y entraîner dans l'espoir d'intégrer l'armée. Sai de casa todas as manhãs para um passeio pelas ruas da Praia da Vitória, na Ilha Terceira. Um ritual que começou com a reforma há dois anos. Carlos Silva trabalhou na base das lajes para os norte-americanos durante 34 anos. Eu costumo dizer muitas vezes em inglês, God bless America. Deus abençoe a América e os americanos, eles só fizeram bem aqui, toda a gente. Nós tínhamos um pagamento superior, duas vezes mais, com o reino mínimo. 15 em 15 dias. So as you noticed, it's uh, vari various uh, stories from coming from various countries with various approaches, and which is very interesting. I'm sorry, Leonor, your story was there, but disappear disappeared in the, in the last editing. I don't know why. Uh, But okay, uh, my first question to the panel will go to Thomas Mignon that now everybody knows because he's our rising star here and uh, he was here yesterday on stage to, to present his uh, checkpoint sequence and he's recently, uh, he was recently appointed as a, um, deputy uh, co editorial coordinator. The editorial co coordination of the project is made in RTBF and uh, the editorial coordinator proposed to Thomas to assist him. And so Thomas, uh, you are a young journalist, you are a rising star, so that's it. Uh, how, how, how do you feel about uh, getting this project of exchange and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the stories as, uh, with your fresh eyes of a, a young journalist? Um, I, I would say it is really rich as we could see it. Uh, even in the stories, in the different types of telling the stories around Europe. And so making, um, making shows from all these materials coming from all the countries, it's really rich. And I mean, that, that is an exchange platform, so it don't cost us anything. That's, so that's basically the, yeah, it's r really rich. And I was astonished how we could have so many quality work from all around Europe and making a great show without moving that much. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Le Leonor, sorry uh, your story is not in, but you, you made a, a very sensitive story about the transsexual in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Spain, in Asturias. And uh, uh, do you feel that the, the fact to, that you will uh, be shown in other countries uh, help you to, to go further in the, in the tricky questions in your society? I know. Um, I think it's, it was a story about minor transsexuals, so that implies lots of, not problems, but uh, issues that you have to manage. First of all, to tackle with the, their families, all the conditions, the, I had to explain them how I was going to use the story, the material, and not just because they were minors, but because uh, they are going through really difficult, uh, difficult situations because um, although they are trying to normalize their situation as uh, minor transsexuals, uh, they, have, they are going through difficult times. It's not easy in a small town where they live to change your sex while you are still a, a young boy. So it, 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 has, it poses many problems. Uh, uh, it, this, this was a story for the people who haven't seen them. It was a story about two minors that lives in the same small town. It's about 12,000 uh, 12, uh, 12, inhabitants. And they both, they attend the same school, high school, and they both change their sex while they were, they were like uh, 15 or so. So you can imagine the situation in a small town where people uh, still don't understand the situation. You are used to, 
to understand uh, when grown people are uh, changing their sex because they are transsexual, they realize, but when they are small children or teenagers, it's still diffi uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult for them, difficult for their families, and, but with this story, I explained to their families that I was trying to help them to normalize their situation. So people, their uh, neighbors, the, the people at their school could, understand, uh, could uh, stop to listen to them, to listen how they felt, how their families felt, and uh, it, it will make things bit, uh, easier for them. And it proves to be real. Uh, uh, families were really happy after we broadcasted the story, and uh, they told us uh, that helped them because they didn't want to hide the situation. They they both thought that, they, that hiding their situation uh, would would uh, be worse for for them. So. That's why uh, when I told them that I was going to broadcast it abroad, they, they, they didn't mind. They, they were happy with the way we had treated them with respect and just letting them uh, speak. We, we, our commentaries were really short. They just let them speak, explain, say how they felt. And that was, that was like a, a touching story mm -hmm. and, you know, it's... And it yeah. drives me to the last question to the panel. Um, speaking about editorial independence, of course, each member is totally free to choose this and this story for his own program. And we experienced uh, some uh, difficulties to broadcast some stories about homosexuality or about uh, sexuality of the, the, um, the disabled person. Uh, should you envisage uh, Piotr, for example, or Martina or, or Victor to, to, to broadcast such kind of uh, difficult topics in your program? Is it, do you have, or do you have to wait to prepare the audience to this kind of uh, stories? Maybe, maybe sometimes there are some problems with, with preparing some uh, pieces, but generally it's a huge, a strong opportunity to show our viewers something else than uh, pieces and, and uh, news from mainstream, because they are behind, they, they are beyond, uh, first of all, mainstream information around Europe. And uh, for example, I can say I am from uh, Poland. I am a coordinator in Polish television regional studio in Rzeszów. This is uh, southeastern Poland. It's near to Ukrainian border. And the uh, line between Azores and, and Rzeszów is the longest way across Europe. This is the last point on the west, last point on the east. And uh, we can show our viewers uh, other things there in uh, normal and uh, stream, not normal uh, situation, not, not normal day. And uh, we don't afraid about problems with uh, putting without uh, changing materials because they have background, they, they have very interesting characters, uh, very inter interesting story. They are very, very interesting for our viewers. And uh, Victor, we know that uh, RTP, uh, RTP SRS is very active in uh, various co-productions. Okay, so I, I think we are the youngest member. It's correct. Sorry? We are we are the youngest member yeah. of the citizenship yeah. for <laughs> yes, <laughs> new <Okay>. generation. <laughs> okay, uh, for us it's a great pleasure uh, to be in this project. We we work with very enthusiasm. And we think um, our journalists um, are uh, also uh, uh, of enthusiastic way in this project. We produce three stories, and we're going to go to the citizenship five uh, soon Sorry. with other stories. But let me tell you that at the beginning I say for oh, myself, oh my God, we are in the middle of the Atlantic between Europe and America. We are in peace, nobody knows us. <laughs> what can we do? Uh, what can we do for citizenship for? Uh, because we don't have the, the great uh, materials and the, uh, the great highlights. We don't have nothing. 
uh, well, but we think very, very soon, <laughs> and we decided to make three stories uh, that uh, I think uh, it's uh, the same stories we can do in Europe in any country. Absolutely. Stories about the problems of the people, yeah. the health, refugees, the ocean, the environment. We have all this also in Azores. And uh, I think we are the last frontier of Europe at West. And uh, in these terms, I think we have something to say, something to produce and something to show to the rest of Europe. This is very enthusiastic for us. Thank you, thank you. It's uh, totally true. Uh, and uh, so we, I think we can uh, thank the panel uh, to be with us. I will show you two short videos of uh, what uh, is done uh, about our layout and uh, credits in uh, other television. I will ask to the panel to leave the, the stage because I will, uh, I will host two other uh, guests during the, the video. Please, applause. Cetățeanul european. Situații specifice. Diversitate. Probleme comune. Reportaje din spațiu. Spațiul comunitar. Europa 360. Duminica de la ora 19.30 la TVR2 și TVR HD. That was Romanian. Dobrodošli u Eurograđane. Danas vas vodimo u Italiju i Bugarsku. Neke od zemalja Evropske unije, kao Danska ili Njemačka, Hrvatska nije među njima. Otišle su... So, was short cuts about uh, the same program in other language. And I think we solved the question of unity in diversity, because you can have in 13 countries the same program with the same layout, the same look, and it's never the same program, as you understood. Uh, all the journalists didn't choose the same stories, so you have the impression to see the same program, but it's never the same program. So that's very interesting for us. And Olivier Amori, welcome. You are representative here of the European Parliament. The European Parliament is very active in uh, supporting the, the co-production. Um, you support us till the beginning, uh, after um, a workshop that we had in the European Parliament to discuss how to cover the, this kind of, of story. Do we, uh, are, are you saying that you, we are obliged to film MEPs in meetings or do you prefer that we show citizens and that we uh, uh, show that Europe exists? And uh, as we know that European Parliament deal with a lot of mm, mm, topics, we cover the topics with the point of view of citizens. A few words uh, on this subject? Um, the main problem of the European Parliament is uh, this top-down approach that we always have in communication meaning we show uh, politicians saying what to do about a certain topic for citizens. Uh, it's normal, but it's, I think we should uh, work the other way around and build a story around the citizens and show them uh, how Europe can help, uh, but on a different level from the citizens' uh, level. Yes. So that's what you do. Uh, as an institution, we cannot do that because it's not our job. So uh, we thank you for doing this. In a, that's also why we, we like to work with CIRCOM because it's, um, it's a regional network and it gives um, a close approach uh, to the message and that's missing uh, nowadays for in Europe. And as you may know, we go uh, one step further. Uh, we give the information about the European Parliament's topics to the citizen, but we revert the approach and now we are asking questions to the MEPs with our stories. We made this first experience two months ago, and let's see. Mm -hmm. 
rouler aussi lentement dans les rues de Londres malgré le péage mis en place en 2003. Tony Travers, chercheur et conseiller du nouveau maire de Londres, estime que ce péage est un échec et un paradoxe. You need a very strong European level to make strong European policy to make sure that in all of the European Union everybody is obliged to go in the same direction. So we will not listen now the answer. Good afternoon, uh, dear Attendez un peu, merci. So, what do you think of this new approach that we uh, we now make uh, bottom up the uh, information? Uh, again, it's uh, it's very good that the citizen is asking the question. Uh, it's uh, it shows the relationship that we're trying to build with the citizens. Um, so that's uh, that's really the main point uh, in our communication. Now we have even have a unit called uh, relation with citizens. So that shows that. Uh, it's a, our main concern, and uh, this is a very good example. And uh, coming to these uh, topics, uh, it's clear that in many European institutions, uh, the, the you, I will call you you, <laughs> uh, uh, are now uh, aware that the citizen needs to be better informed, better informed than communicate. Uh, and we made uh, recently a workshop with uh, the DG Regio, Laura Serrasio, you don't represent DG Regio, but the committee of the region, uh, but you are uh, working in the same area, and it is close uh, to the citizen. Maybe uh, you can have a few words, and after that we will have a, a, a message uh, that uh, was addressed by the director of communication of the DG Regio. Please, Laura, a few words. Yes, um, well, I would say we are very close to the European Commission, and especially the director general, who, um, uh, DG Regio, which is the director general of the European Commission dealing on regional policy, and regional policy is also uh, one of the core businesses of the institution I represent, um, which is the European Committee of the Regions, um, EU institution representing regions and cities in Brussels. We have as members uh, mayors or presidents of regions, so people will have uh, their job back home and come to Brussels regularly to uh, represent uh, the cities and regions into the EU legislation. And certainly regional policy, uh, meaning uh, this part of the EU money, which is almost one third of the budget, who is uh, given to regions to help them uh, recover in the gaps between the uh, richest and uh, less rich regions in, in Europe. Um, it's a huge part of the budget, it's one third. Um, it's, uh, it's something which is uh, crucial to a lot of regions in Europe. Uh, but it's also something that it's probably not enough uh, visible or not enough uh, perceived. Uh, maybe because uh, it's uh, um, taken for granted from uh, some uh, citizens, maybe because uh, uh, the institutional communication is not enough, uh, maybe because there is uh, uh, certain links that are missed somewhere, maybe uh, later on we could uh, elaborate more uh, on that. Yes, because the person who addresses a message goes in this sense. If I can have the video. No, the, the other one. The other one. Uh, uh. No, the next. Next. This Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I am very sorry that I cannot join you physically in the Azores for your annual conference, but I am very glad that you accept my video presence. And I am even more thrilled that you engage with me and my colleagues from the European Commission on the very important subject of reporting about Europe. The European Union, through its cohesion policy, delivers very tangible benefits to Europeans to help sustain our European way of life. In every region in the EU, and sometimes in every street of large cities, a school, hospital, road, or metro line was built or renovated with funds under the EU's cohesion policy. However, people do not associate the EU with these goods. In fact, people often associate the EU with complicated rules, but not with the improvements in the life quality that these rules bring. They see 
technical EU regulations on how water should be transported, but they don't think of the EU when they drink safely water from the tub everywhere in the EU. They read about complex EU rules for energy efficiency in buildings, but they do not make the link with the EU when they pay their reduced energy bill at the end of the month. You, journalists, often poke fun at the thick booklets of EU rules, but don't think of the EU when you pay no roaming when you travel to the Azores for this conference or for your holidays. Indeed, people do not think of the EU when they surf on the internet or use their new sports facilities open in their neighborhood. For far too long, everybody has focused on talking about the rules, processes and procedures of the EU and not on what concrete goods it delivers for the people and on the stories with which the people can identify emotionally. It is a fact and a well-documented one that the widespread benefits brought by cohesion policy are not sufficiently known to the people in the EU. According to the latest Eurobarometer survey of uh, opinion of September 2015, only about a third of the EU's population was aware of EU regional policy projects like the one I mentioned before, and the situation is sta stable compared to the previous survey. From those aware about regional policy, three quarters have a positive impression. A new Eurobarometer survey is planned for later this year and will provide fresh insights into people's awareness of regional policy. But the tremendously important thing to remember is that for a large majority of people, the first source of information about regional or cohesion policy is television. And this is something that comes across clearly through all Eurobarometer opinion surveys over the years. So, dear colleagues, you are one of the keys for solving this communication deficit. And this is one of the reasons why the European Commission, uh, my colleagues in particular, have decided to organize with CIRCOM a series of workshops for television journalists about reporting about the EU and addressing the challenges in uh, presenting projects funded by regional uh, policy. So, we of course would have preferred to have her here and to challenge her, uh, but okay, the message is clear. Uh, comment please, or uh, estimated get to who can, please, Laura, uh, Olivier. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the message is, is quite clear and what I was saying before is that um, now there is a lot more consciousness uh, and I'm not talking just in the, in the Brussels bubble or in EU institutions but also among citizens and this is thanks to Brexit because we, uh, we all realize now that we know that probably something is going to miss tomorrow maybe we citizens just think a bit more about uh, what is Europe and they just maybe um, didn't inform themselves a lot or uh, just didn't care in their daily life, didn't uh, reflect about uh, what EU has brought to me, to my life, to my neighborhood, to my region, to my country. Um, now that we are all confronted with Brexit, and I'm not just thinking about our uh, British uh, um, fellows, but about what this would mean for us as well, I think people are just starting thinking much more uh, what the absence of Europe would be. And, uh, well, of course, in the case of Brexit, there's uh, something very disruptive and huge, but also if we talk now about uh, uh, regional policy, uh, this EU money that it's maybe sometimes not very well perceived by uh, uh, citizens, um, it's not there forever. Uh, there are huge risks actually. And um, for the next financial programming in uh, 2020, uh, because uh, on one side, of course, uh, UK, which is a net contributor, is going to go out, which means uh, and this is fact, at least uh, 10 billion euro less in the EU budget. Uh, but this is not the only risk. Um, there are uh, new priorities uh, in Europe in recent years, such as immigration and defense, and uh, there are more and more um, interlocutors at national level that are interested to get more resources from the EU budget for those priorities. And the, the EU money pot is the same one. So if somebody has to take money from the, 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 
the EU budget, uh, usually it's agriculture and regional policy, the, the, the policies which are going to lose money because they are the biggest. Agriculture is the first one and regional policy is the second one. So um, regions are beneficiaries of uh, regional policy. Of course, certain regions in Europe more than others. And I think it's important that, we, um, that the citizens are in, informed uh, in all means. I mean, uh, institutions do their part institutionally uh, for, with institutional communication. Media do their part. Uh, but I um, sometimes wonder why this kind of um, news report that we have seen into the uh, citizenship project are, uh, in my point of view, maybe you're, you're, you don't agree with me, are so rare. I don't see uh, so many of these reports and I'm just wondering why and maybe uh, it would be interesting to have a debate to understand what and where is the missing link. And thank you for the transition because we, uh, Ms. Dana Spinant uh, uh, mentioned the workshop we had in Brussels. It was a three-part uh, workshop uh, gathering uh, 16 journalists from 13 countries and we had a lot of stories about this topic, general topic. Let's have a look. Čeprav je bilo veliko nasprotovanj, so pred dobrima dvema letoma tudi s pomočjo sredstev Evropskega sklada za regionalni razvoj začeli graditi 53 metrov in pol visok razgledni stolp Vinarium, ki je čez noč postal tretja najbolj obiskana znamenitost v državi. Comparten historias, costumes en mesmo lazos familiares. Por eso, hay casi de Zanos decidieron eliminar una frontera que tan solo existía sobre el papel y convertirse en una eurocidad. Well, I was reminded that there are so many things um, about EU funds and um, that we can report on local level that really uh, affects people and that uh, could be good pieces, good news stories. For many of the citizens, this was the only way to get to the nearest of the country or to get to the food supply. U obnovi i pomoć uključili su se svi, Srpska vlada, Evropska unija i naravno svi volonteri, čija želja bila da ovim ljudima vrate osmeh na lice. Alla de sex halländska kommunerna har själva fått identifiera vad de saknar i etableringsfasen och utifrån det har projektledningen utformat aktiviteter som hälsan i hylte. Ett annat exempel på aktivitet handlar om sociala koder på arbetsplatsen. Well, for me, I, I, I really benefit from meeting all the people from the workshops and uh, different uh, countries, different experiences, but in the end we face the similar problems. So it gives me like uh, hope. So that's concrete. We saw some action, uh, some journalist made story, uh, maybe it will be create a, it will create again a new dynamic like in the citizenship project we we shall see it on the future maybe a last word about about this general policy and then uh, laura you will introduce our conclusion with a very cute video please conclude and so laura the floor is yours uh, yeah the, the the last video um so it's more about something that institutions are trying to do uh, as direct communication to citizens. So we have been speaking up until now about what is the institutional communication, the communication through media, but there is quite a lot that uh, institutions try to do uh, directly uh, with citizens. Uh, all the institutions, so the parliament does it, the commission does it, and the committee of the regions do does it as well. Um, for my institution, uh, since we are the institution who represents really the local and regional authorities, what we do is, um, uh, it's twofold. On the one hand, we try to support what our members uh, do uh, on their own. Um, and a very good example is the video that we are going to see. Um, the, the, one of our members uh, is the president of the Azores that you had the chance to see uh, yesterday at the gala, Mr. Vasco Alves Cordero. Um, the government of the Azores uh, launched uh, an interesting uh, uh, program to stimulate the reflection about Europe 
uh, especially for young people. Um, there are different axes in this program, um, some projects into the schools uh, with um, children of primary schools, so mainly through uh, games and uh, um, discussion at, of course, the level of uh, young pupils. And then they had um, a video competition and we are going to see the, the winning uh, report of this video competition. So the, um, the children of secondary school this time were uh, just invited to uh, think about what it means for them uh, to, to, to have a European citizenship, a European identity, and to express this in form of, uh, uh, of images. Um, and uh, the, the other thing the Committee of the Regions does is it has an own uh, campaign uh, which is called Reflecting on Europe. Uh, it's basically um, local uh, dialogues with citizens that are organized, uh, again, through our members, mayors, councillors, regional presidents, etc. But uh, they really try to involve uh, local associations and uh, to have the communities uh, present, so to involve involve uh, citizens um, as much as they can and their voice is heard through a survey um, and this survey will then be included into a resolution uh, from the Committee of the Regions which will then be part of uh, the EU uh, legislation on the, the reflection on the future of Europe. So it's always uh, good when the European institution get out of the Brussels bubble, and it <laughs> drives to amazing results. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Olivier. We will uh, conclude this session with this cute video. So thank you all. Como se constrói a felicidade? Com pequenos gestos. Pequenos nadas que se multiplicam e se transformam no arco-íris da vida. Constrói-se com momentos e lugares que se agarram à memória do tempo e perduram para sempre. Descobrimos a felicidade em cada comunidade onde vivemos. Preservamos valores. Fazemos dela o melhor lugar do mundo para ser o que somos. Mas então agora eu gostava que vocês fizessem um desenho sobre o vosso mundo ideal. Pode ser? Sim! O meu mundo ideal é um mundo que se renova e aperfeiçoa constantemente. É feito de justiça e de solidariedade, onde sonhar é possível e ninguém é esquecido. Ninguém fica sozinho. Aqui, encontramos oportunidades sem fim. Defendemos a liberdade e a amizade. Aprendemos muitas línguas. Comunicamos com todos. Partilhamos uma herança que não pode ter fim. O meu mundo é uma comunidade que respeita a diversidade e que se une à adversidade. Importamos-nos com os outros. Cuidamos de quem precisa. Neste mundo, somos todos iguais. Mas há diferenças que fazem sentido. É este o mundo que trago guardado em mim. É este o mundo que me faz feliz. Este mundo é real. Este mundo existe. Este mundo é o meu. I don't know if we have time for some question. Quick question? No. No. Thank you very so much. So the question will be on the coffee break. <laughs> it's time for coffee break. We continue after 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>